And joining us now on the debate in Quebec City, Réal Seguin, Quebec political reporter with the Globe and Mail. In Montreal, Quebec, Christian Bourque, executive vice president and partner at Léger Marketing. And in our nation's capital, François Charbonneau, assistant professor of politics at the University of Ottawa, and Chantal Hébert, national affairs writer at the Toronto Star. And while I'm happy to welcome all of you to the broadcast tonight, I'm going to put just a little extra cherry on top for Réal and for Chantal, because none of you will remember this because you're all so young. The three of us were all Queen's Park reporters 125 years ago and shared the same office. And it was a delight. So it's so nice to have you all back for this little reunion. Bienvenue, everybody. Let me start by uh, just sharing with you and our viewers some of the basic numbers about Quebec. First, the basics uh, from StatsCan and then some polling numbers. Here's Quebec today. Population 7.9 million. Gross domestic product of $319 billion. The unemployment rate higher than the national average at 8.7 percent. The gross debt of the province at $173 billion. And the annual deficit for the fiscal year we're about to leave $3.8 billion. Now, this could be an election year in Quebec, and what do the polls tell us about how things are going there? Voter intentions today, there's the Liberals, and the Parti Québécois, and the ADQ, which is dead now, and Quebec Solidaire, and the Greens, and then look up, and there is the CAC, or the Coalition, as we call it in English Canada, the Coalition, which is in first place despite the fact that it is really just in its nascent stages. So, Christian, let's go to you first on this, because these are your poll numbers. What's the most important finding on that set of numbers that you think we need to know more about? A couple of things. Uh, the Liberals now have been climbing up uh, in the polls over the past three months. The, the PQ has stabilized in the low 20s, uh, even with you know, all that's been happening at that party over the past few weeks. And the Coalition has been trending slightly down over the past two months from 37, which was at sort of their height, uh, and now at 32, so, uh, but they're still number one and, and getting close to four out of ten francophone votes in the province, which of course is important for a majority of the writings in the province. Chantal, it's not unusual in Quebec for parties to appear on the scene, you know, come on with a blaze of glory and then, as we've just seen with the ADQ, essentially disappear a few years later. So how real do you think that CAQ support truly is? Well, it, it is real in intentions, but as you know, and as we were reminded the last spring with the federal election, campaigns do matter in Quebec. Uh, the first campaign that uh, Mr. Chagas won, he started behind the Parti Québécois and he still finished the winner. I uh, have looked to Canada's recent history, I've looked at all the provinces, I have not found an instance of a party that started from scratch to power in a single election, so if, if the coalition number held, it would really be uh, quite a historical uh, breakthrough uh, and a precedent. But uh, I think the proof of that is going to be uh, in the election. Look at those francophone numbers, uh, and you can see that there could be quite a dogfight there. To be sure, quote unquote, time will tell is an answer we can give many times today. But given, you know, Real, let me go to you on this. You, you, you've got a pretty good sense of how things go politically in Quebec. How real does the support for CAQ seem to you today? The support is very volatile, and I think uh, the, uh, the last federal election was an indication of that, and that is what is making the CAQ quite nervous at this stage. They know that that support came up really quickly. I mean, this is a coalition that was launched a year ago, and it'll be a year in February. They were officially uh, pronounced as officially a party back in uh, November, and with that level of support, they know they have to uh, get the money, the candidates, and the organization in place for the election campaign. They've started doing that. They know full well that this vote can change rather quickly if they make mistakes, and that is what the PQ and Jean Charest's Liberals as well are gambling on over the next few months as the uh, Liberals look for a window of opportunity to call that election. Now, Francois, of course, people in Ontario are accustomed to watching things in their next door province with a keen eye, and to the extent they know anything about this new coalition, they probably know that this is a party that has put sovereignty on the back burner for now. Beyond that, what do we need to know about what this party stands for? Uh, well, it's interesting because this is a party that calls itself a coalition. I mean, there's there's something intrinsically problematic in that definition. You're either you're a party, you get into a coalition, but you can't be a party that's a coalition. Which means that in the long run, uh, eventually, it will start to become more and more a party, and not look to the voters as a coalition. Now, the idea of a coalition is interesting because it's the idea that you're going to go past 
one of the major problem in Quebec politics is that you have a large portion of the population that still wants uh, sovereignty, but no one believes that it will happen anytime soon. And so someone like Pauline Marois is caught between a rock and a hard place because her base wants it tomorrow morning, the rest of the po but she, she knows the rest of the population uh, doesn't think it will happen anytime soon. And so she's, she's stuck there. The idea of a coalition is that you you can uh, you can that pretends that it's going that we're going to look look past that is is interesting but since the question nationale is not solved uh, that question will come back to haunt them uh, if if they get into power or during the, uh, the during the election for sure Chantal I think it was you who referenced the orange wave in your last answer so let me follow up with you on this one uh, of course uh, there was never a more astonishing election in, federally in Quebec than. Uh, the one that just took place where the NDP came out of nowhere to take 59 seats. But tell us what impact you think that federal result, if any, is having on the provincial scene at the moment. Hmm. Um, uh, the first thing, I guess, from, from outside that people should know is that uh, voting for the NDP, obviously a known quantity outside Quebec, is uh, anything but a vote for the center right. Mr. Legault and his coalition are seen as uh, more conservative the, uh, than the, the Liberals and the Parti Québécois. So you're asking the same voters in the same year to go a bit to the right, having gone to the left. Uh, and that basically means that things haven't gelled. Uh, the orange wave sent a powerful signal initially, certainly that uh, Quebecers wanted to break out of the box. But if you believe that part of the reason why Quebecers voted for a national party it was that they didn't want Stephen Harper uh, to win a majority and that that happened, you have to think that after eight months of rather uncertain performance of the NDP uh, in the House of Commons, a leadership campaign that is not getting a lot of attention in Quebec, uh, because Quebec doesn't matter all that much to the outcome, uh, there aren't that many members in, in the province, at this point it's probably having a negative effect for federalism. Uh, because there is a sense uh, in Quebec that uh, you have the Harper government that has little Quebec representation and a very weak Quebec representation on the opposition side of the House of Commons. And on that, there was one number in that poll that really stuck with me, and it was the number that showed 70% of Quebecers are worried about the future of the province. That's a number that's usually better for the Parti Québécois than for any other party. And that's a number, I would argue, that is driven by the weakness of the NDP and the absence of Quebec from the Conservative government. Let me follow up with Christian on that number. 70% worried about the future of the province. Does that mean economically? Does that mean as a part of Canada? What, what exactly does it mean? It, it's sort of, of an overall sort of, of statement that we want in terms of, of uh, how concerned Quebecers are over the immediate future of the province, but it wasn't spelled out to being in terms of, of its place in the Federation. Uh, I, I think, though, something needs to happen. Um, there's a huge void in Quebec politics. We've got over 77% of Quebecers who say they are dissatisfied with their current provincial government. Over 75 say they're dissatisfied with their federal government. Um, they basically last May said that we're not sure we want this sort of federalist, sovereignist type politics in Quebec. And the way they showed that was by sort of dismantling uh, the sovereignist side, which created the crisis of the Parti Québécois afterward. Um, so something has to fill that void. Uh, I think the coalition, though, as uh, its main sort of trump card, is the fact that they're saying we're autonomous. Uh, we're, we're basically outside of the traditional divide between federalist and sovereignist, and there is a lot of room uh, for that in the province. I don't know how they'll be able to play that, uh, but something has to fill the void. I think last May, Quebecers yeah. said, uh, we're so dissatisfied with our current politics where we've become so cynical that we'll just clean the house. And basically, that's, that's what they did in May. They wanted to throw everybody out. Uh, will they do the same in the provincial election? Much tougher to, to, to do, but something has to fill the void. Will it be Francois Legault or, or somebody else? But right now, uh, Quebec politics is basically just a, a gray cloud following a storm. Hmm. I guess this is a good time to remind everybody that one of the reasons why Quebec politics is so fascinating is that they don't just have the left-right debate, they also have the federalist sovereignist debate, which makes it twice as complicated and perhaps twice as interesting as politics in every other province. But let's leave the federalist sovereignist one aside for a second. Rael, help us with this. How does a province only, whatever it was, nine months ago, uh, vote overwhelmingly for the Social Democratic Party, the NDP, federally,
but now appears to be poised to elect a more right-wing government provincially. Explain that to us. I think one of the reasons why they went with the NDP was mainly because of the leadership, Jack Layton's leadership more than anything else. And there's also a strong, a strong factor that plays into that as well is that uh, Quebecers are more inclined to wanting to protect many of the, the, the social values that they, they, they cherish so much. I mean, with, uh, with all of the social programs that have come into place, daycare, $5, $7 a day daycare, and uh, 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 several other programs that have been put into place, they're willing to pay the higher taxes to protect those programs, and I think that played well into the, the NDP's own program. Now, the Bloc Québécois as well defended those values and those issues as well, but in, in the sense that they're willing to go with, with this new coalition uh, based on perhaps of, on, on the fact that, well, two factors. One is that they're fed up with the, the federal liberals, uh, largely because of this whole issue of corruption that emerged over the last two years, and especially last fall, that has plagued the Sade government. That's one particular thing, and there's a, actually a public inquiry that has been set up. After 30 months of demanding it, the Sade government finally caved in and will hold that public inquiry. And they know all too well that this may harm their chances at re-election should there be major revelations during the public hearings. The second thing as well, I think, is the Parti Québécois itself. I mean, we've gone through, since the last referendum, 15 years of PQ leadership setting soft-peddling the issue of sovereignty, refusing to uh, put forward a strong agenda and a strategy to achieve their objective. We had Lucien Bouchard with his so-called winning conditions, Bernard Landry with his so-called moral, he'll hold a referendum if he has the moral authority to do it, and then uh, put in Marois who says she'll hold a referendum only if uh, there, she, she believes she has uh, the, um, the uh, I guess, the, 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 not the winning conditions, but the, uh, the, uh, the most opportune time. All of this has, has created a great deal of uncertainty among the nationalist forces in Quebec, among francophones who would be inclined to listen to what strategy the PQ would be willing to put forward on, on sovereignty, and now feel that this is a party that really isn't going nowhere with their options. And now they're opening, they're opening themselves up to other possibilities, even something like a more right-of-center coalition party like uh, the one presented by François Legault. And that, I think, has been one of the main reasons why we're seeing this emergence of a right-of-center party after they had voted so, so strongly for Jack Layton's NDP back in May. Okay, so Francois, let's follow up on that then. And again, uh, away from the left-right, now let's get on to the sovereignist federalist. We know that Jean Charest's government uh, is not going to hold a referendum. We know that Parti Québécois would like to someday under certain circumstances, uh, perhaps sooner rather than later. The CAQ has kind of played that sweet spot right in the middle. Uh, sovereignty on hold for a long time. Politically speaking, is that the smartest place to be in Quebec society today? Uh, it might just very well be when you have a, a population that doesn't think independence or sovereignty will happen anytime soon. So again, that do, you don't dissatisfy a portion of the population that wants it one day. Uh, those who want it tomorrow morning will, any, will vote for the PQ anyways. Uh, but if you, look at the, if you look at that poll, uh, a, a good proportion of those uh, who are about to vote for the CAC uh, are sti still support uh, sovereignty. I think it's about 40, 50 percent close to that. So, uh, and a moratorium doesn't mean you don't want it anymore. It just means that you want to uh, wait a few years for that to happen if, and, and so forth. But it's, it's an uncomfortable place to be for a party uh, at election times. And when the qu inevitable questions will come up, uh, what's your stand on this? Now, think about You have to remember that the notion of autonomy is certainly not something that's peculiar to this party. It was the platform of the uh, Liberals in 2003, written by Benoit Pelletier, uh, who said that uh, their politics was about autonomy. No one picked it up. Uh, in 2007, the uh, ADQ made the autonomy uh, its, uh, its platform and had some success um, um, and, uh, and forced Jean Charest to criticize a notion that was in his own, in his own platform, but no one saw the irony. Uh, and now the, now the, the term autonomy is coming back through Le CAC, uh, it might have some electoral success, uh, at least for one election. But in the long term, it's hard to see how that can play out. But Christian, let's just make sure we're all speaking the same language here. When, when Quebecers talk about autonomy, they're not talking about a separate country, right? They're talking about something different. Isn't that right? 
some form of renewed federalism or more power to the provinces or a form of decentralization, basically, is what I think it would sum it up. Um, there's something, though, that's happening deep in the sovereignty movement, though, that uh, I think should worry the, the sovereignist forces. Uh, demographically, the optics do not look right for that movement. Um, in that, uh, up until this new generation of voters, uh, usually all new uh, or, or, or among those who were entering into the electorate, those young voters, a majority of them tended to be favorable to sovereignty. Now the last 12 years of new voters uh, are not uh, favoring sovereignty. So as we're moving forward, um, it, it, it's losing a little bit of, it, of its space. It's almost like it, it's looking now that it's sort of, it was a baby boomer's dream sort of thing. Um, and, and, and they need to renew that discourse. They need to find new sort of handlebars uh, uh, to, to make themselves appealing uh, to younger voters who right now do not even care. When I was in university, people used to say, are you a sovereignist or a federalist? If you ask today a, a, a young voter on, on a university campus, they kind of look at you funny. Um, hmm. it, it's just not what dominates their headspace right now when they think about politics. What's the question they ask if it's not sovereignist or federalist? It's, it's on equity, it's on um, uh, fairness in our system, um, it's on global politics, it's on education, um, <laughs> health care, pensions, how will we support the elderly uh, in the next few years. There's uh, tons of issues that appear uh, before that of sovereignty. Um, so so it's, that movement has to fight its way back and become uh, current uh, and pertinent uh, once more. They've lost a little bit of that luster over the past few years. Interesting. Chantal, let me try this with you. Tonight we're doing Quebec. Thursday night we're doing Alberta. Tomorrow night we're doing uh, the Harper government and in particular what came out of Davos. So three different Canadian political stories over the next three nights. And I want to just get your view on what Pauline Marois, the leader of the Parti Québécois, had to say about Stephen Harper's Davos speech when he talked about pension reform. She said this is now all the more reason why Quebec has to quote unquote change countries. What did you think of that play by her? Um, I thought that uh, if there is a, a, a line that uh, Pauline Marois can use, because I believe that if the PQ uh, were to win the next Quebec election, it would not be out of a great outpour of nationalism and out of the desire to have a referendum tomorrow uh, or because they'd found the secret formula, it would be because Pauline Marois would have managed to cast herself as uh, probably the, the biggest, uh, least pleasant uh, government that you can put in the way of Stephen Harper. So for her to, to take that on, I think is probably a very wise move. Over the past uh, six, seven months, and the poll does show that, since uh, Stephen Harper has had this majority, there's been a very difficult fall in Quebec in the sense of legislation after legislation that is rejected not only by, by sovereigntists or by the opposition parties in the House of Commons, but by the Quebec government itself. And you see that uh, sovereignty, which went uh, sharply down uh, for most of last year, has now started going up again. I think that is not related, obviously, to the performance of the Parti Québécois, which has been fighting uh, against its leader for all those months, but rather related to a backlash against the federal government. Now, if, like me, you believe that sovereignty has not been on a great march forward for three decades in Quebec, but that it actually got a reprieve with the Meech Lake crisis, then you have to also think that if there was going to be a picking up of sovereignty's fortunes, it would be by some event driven by events outside Quebec. And at this point, you have to look at the Harper government. Okay. Let us uh, get a little bit behind the numbers now and have some discussion about, and uh, as I said off the top of the program, we've got two former Queen's Park reporters here, so you'll be ideally situated to help us with this. Queen's Park, since World War II, three parties, the same three parties, always represented in the legislature. Progressive conservatives, liberals, new Democrats. In Quebec, you know, it, it seems every week you pick up the paper, there's something new out there. Uh, we talked about the polls off the top. Social credit's been in there. Parti Québécois, the Equality Party, the CAC now. Quebec Solidaire, ADQ, the Conservative Party of Quebec is making noises now. Federally, the NDP is a new player. This is an incredibly volatile province, and we need to get into some discussion here about why that is. Francois, do you want to start us off? Why is Quebec politics so seemingly uh, transient? 
Uh, it's a good question, um, but I don't think that the Quebec electorate is that volatile if you compare it to, uh, you have the same phenomenon in Canada, political parties emerging uh, all through the 80s and 90s and, and, and uh, until until the situation went back to what it was, which is basically two, two major party and a third uh, uh, and a third opposition party, which is now the uh, the Liberals. But the uh, the situation in Quebec is akin to, I mean, that it's a type of situation that you find in places uh, where you have a, a British type of parliamentary system where you can't have these uh, these types of coalitions uh, that uh, that uh, or you know that, that it's not part of the tradition and there's sort of a, the, the the political landscape is seen as, as being blocked and so you have uh, a multiplicity of political parties that are emerging it's very true uh, in, uh, in, in as far as sovereignist political parties are, are concerned, there's four now, for three, four now. Uh, you also have, uh, but because you have the two, um, uh, basically uh, preoccupations, which is the left-right uh, division and the sovereignist federalists. Well, then you have political parties emerging uh, that are either from the right uh, and and, uh, and and favor sovereignty. To the left and favor sovereignty, to the right favor federalism, to the, and et cetera, et cetera. So you have a multiplicity of political parties. Uh, of course, that phenomenon would be enhanced by uh, a type of representative, uh, a, a, a type of uh, regime that would be representative. Uh, but you have more, uh, you'd have coalitions uh, that would be long lasting. Whereas now, while well, you have political parties that emerge and that die in the next election, which is probably what's going to happen in the next uh, provincial election, one mm -hmm. of the major parties might, uh, might suffer. For a, a, a defeat that uh, a long-term defeat it might happen to the Parti Québécois. It might even happen to the Liberal parties because what may happen to the Liberal, liberal Party is that it may, uh, in the next election, only get support uh, from uh, Montreal from people in Montreal. And if that occurs, because its base, uh, its francophone base, is, has been dwindling, uh, uh, it, it seems in the, in the past 30 years, and it, it now uh, the numbers uh, show that they have almost no support amongst francophones. I think perhaps uh, uh, Christian Bourquin can tell us, but I think it's at about 20 percent. It's very very low, and uh, I don't think they're they're not going to they're going to go do good at the next. Uh, at the next election among okay, the French let me get, population, and that can't last forever. Let, let me get everybody to comment on this, and Francois, I'll give you a yeah. chance to fight with that uh, earpiece a little more. It's being very stubborn I'm with having, you today. Yeah. That's okay. Uh, Raël, you want to come in here and explain why you think Quebec, pol uh, Quebec voters seem to prefer, as opposed to reinvigorating the existing parties, which is what we do in Ontario, they just create new ones. Uh, what, why do you think that is? Because the national question, the whole issue of Quebec's place in Canada, and the whole issue of Quebec independence has been part of the political landscape for the last 40 years and still remains unresolved. And until that issue is resolved, you're going to see the emergence of, of parties with new ideas who will either be for or against uh, certain positions with respect to its place within Canada or with respect to more right-wing or left-wing ideologies, But as, as it was mentioned earlier. But certainly the fact that Federalism itself uh, has evolved to the point after the Meech Lake Accord where now it's a status quo that rings. We've talked about this poll that came out recently. Well, only 21% of Quebecers support the status quo. Yet the contradiction in that is you have a party that's emerged, the, co the coalition party, that, refused, that says that we won't debate the issue of constitution, federal, uh, uh, renewed federalism or sovereignty for the next 10, 15 years, and we're going to tackle real concrete issues such as education and health. That is playing into one major factor that has evolved since the last referendum, I believe. And as I mentioned earlier, it's the fact that the political party that was supposed to put forward the whole idea, defend the whole idea of sovereignty, has backtracked on that and has been soft peddling it from the beginning, where people apparently would probably would want to see a much more clear picture, clear idea as to where that party is going. The PQ has become more of an autonomous party uh, than of a sovereignist party. P put in Marois's first objective, she said, is to go out there and get more powers from Ottawa while defending Quebec's interests. That may help her win some votes, but I think it will create a great deal of uncertainty among voters who in the past have turned away from the party that has done that. Uh, they turned away. At, at, they turned away from the PQ under Bernard Landry in 2003. They refused to move with the PQ. After that, they actually went with the ADQ in 2007. 
And that is a major handicap for the, for the Parti Québécois. As long as voters feel that uncertainty, they feel that the uncertainty within the leadership that it doesn't even believe in its own option, they will be leery about supporting that particular party in the, and just giving it the, the, uh, a mandate to offer what they call or what the PQ calls good government. If that's the case, then they may just as well look at other options such as the coalition and who knows, maybe even turn back to Jean Charest's liberals if the, the, the Jean Charest it has the ability to win back some of that francophone vote that it lost because of a tarnished uh, credibility over the whole issue of corruption in the construction industry. Mm -hmm. Chantel, what's your theory on this? Well, uh, I was watching uh, two weeks ago the uh, Action Démocratique Party uh, bury itself and, and announced that it was going to disappear to join the, the new coalition. And I was struck that the, uh, over a period of 12 months, the Bloc Québécois has basically been deconstructed by voters and the ADQ is self-destructed. Those two parties were born out of the Meech Lake crisis. Uh, and it seems to me that this multiplicity of parties that we're seeing now, some of which I don't think will live beyond one election, are the product of the falling apart of the coalition that was built around sovereignty for the 1995 referendum. After all these years, the notion that there will be another battle fought on the same terms uh, has now been proven to be moot. Uh, and so there is a reorganization. But sometimes, you know, we spend a lot of time trying to show Quebec is different from other provinces. Sometimes it's not. Uh, what we have seen in Canada over the past decade and a half is the emergence of more and more three-party systems in a number of provinces. Look at Atlantic Canada, where the NDP has become a force to contend with. Twenty years ago, it was just liberals and conservatives. So up to a point, it could be that Quebec, too, is moving to a three-party system. And that would mean that the more likely outcome of the next election, uh, when people aren't too sure what they want to do, that's usually the outcome is a minority government. Hmm. And as we'll see Thursday night on this program, Alberta right now has five parties represented in their provincial legislature. Christian, I haven't heard from you yet on this. Give us your view. Well, the, the thing about the national uh, issue or question or national <laughs> unity is, uh, is that we think people want to decide. In some of our polls, we'll get 37% to say they would vote yes if there is a referendum, sometimes 42, 43. It's sort of basically in that range. But that means or, or that suggests that people want to decide on that issue. Right now, what we're feeling in Quebec is, uh, is people just basically don't really, not that they don't care, but uh, they don't want to make that decision. They want to make other decisions. Um, and that sort of further sort of muddies the waters a little bit because all of the new parties that, have, uh, that we've seen sort of, of, of uh, come onto the, the, uh, the political scene in Quebec are basically a, is a break off from another party. The PQ was a break off from the Liberals. It eventually killed the Union Nationale. The ADQ was a break off from the Liberals again. Um, and, and of course, the Coalition is more or less a break off of the Parti Québécois and a merger of that Union Nationale. Um, and even though the national unity question is not being resolved or, or not suggested to be resolved by Francois Legault, I think in part uh, it's a reflection of, of Quebecers right now who are on both sides saying, um, we don't care to decide uh, in the short term. So hmm. it's very hard to see what will happen. I think the most likely outcome will be this sort of three-way race um, where if you had to put $2, you would sort of put it on a minority government right now because of how the, the numbers are, are playing out. Um, but I don't see how this next election would become the start of something uh, or something important or major when it comes to national unity. It's more sort of a putting it aside um, for a little while, regardless if the Parti Québécois comes out the winner, the Liberals or the Coalition. Hmm. But Francois, if I hear the undercurrent of what all of you are saying, it's that until the Canada-Quebec question is finally resolved once and for all, Quebec politics is going to be like this. It's going to be volatile, it's going to be trying on new brands of political parties all the time. So in essence, until this I think as uh, Perizzo used to call it, this visit to the dentist is finally over with one way or another. This is the way it's going to be. Is that right? Might very I well be. I think the dentist's door uh... is closed. Sorry, Raoul, what did you say? Uh, I think that the, the dentist's door has been closed and shut for good and that Ottawa will not, never again, I don't think, want to open the constitutional debate. So they're going to, it's basically telling, telling Quebec to, they're going Perhaps, to have to live the... with the status quo and, and, and uh, changes is not, is not about to come. And I think we've seen it with the Harper government. 
And Quebec will have to decide at one point whether or not it will accept to, to go on and be governed as a province or make that choice to become an independent country. And, that, and that's something that's probably being taking shape right now with the Harper government, especially with uh, many of decisions that it's taken in the past. It's, it's shown that uh, there, there's no possibility of bringing the type of changes that many Quebecers want. So that has as well fueled cynicism. And I think uh, political columnist Jose Legault mentioned her, uh, summed it up best when she says that uh, what is fueling cynicism is uh, the downplaying of Quebec's, uh, of, uh, of Quebec's demands, of Quebec's sovereignty. And uh, that, of course, is not the case. When, uh, when you ridicule those, those issues, I think it just will serve in the end to bring them to light and probably bring, make them more prominent. But at, this, at the current stage, how the situation stands right now is that there is no possibility for the type of changes that either the PQ wants or maybe the CAQ, because they have not yet come up with their list of demands that they will make on Ottawa. They will have to do that. François Legault said he will do that pretty soon. But uh, Let's hear certainly François Charbonneau the, on this. Uh, the door is closed. Uh, perhaps the, the store is closed, but the dentist left the patient in the chair. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, the situation hasn't been resolved. Quebec has not signed on to the Constitution, and that can come back anytime there will be a, a, a crisis uh, or a, a major disagreement with uh, how the uh, Canada is being, uh, is being governed. And um, Stephen Harper, I think, um, did something in 2006 which was completely contrary to his, his, his the reasons why he, he went into politics that is um, for politically for, for circuit for political reasons he decided to do things that were uh, again completely contrary to what he believes that is he recognized Quebec as a as a as a nation uh, within Quebecers. the United Canada he but still he Quebecers did as a nation it, well, fine. We, we, uh, again, he, that was done uh, uh, through a declaration, but not, uh, not of course, in the Constitution. But this is explicitly what he fought against when, uh, in 1990, during the Meech Lake Accord, again, uh, he, he, he came out uh, against the Calgary Declaration for that very reason. Um, he did so in 2006, hoping to get some results in Quebec, give a, a chair uh, at the UNESCO, also hoping to get some results in Quebec. He hasn't gotten any results in Quebec, and now that he has a majority government, uh, he's obviously uh, passed any compromise or, I mean, all his efforts, uh, I think, uh, had no uh, of results. And of course, for him, uh, now I think he's governing Canada. Uh, in a way, I think that uh, most Quebecers uh, uh, most Quebecers don't understand the way Stephen Harper now is governing Canada. I mean, the comeback of the, 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 the portraits of the queens all over the place, the, the, uh, the, the royal visits, and I mean, all that, uh, or the uh, renaming the Navy uh, Royal has absolutely no resonance in Quebec. Mm -hmm. and it's something that's, uh, that, that has the potential, if it's pushed too far, uh, of having some backlash in Quebec, I think, and, and sparking another crisis. I mean, we're not there yet. But who knows? Okay. Chantal, I, I do want to ask you about the Premier of Quebec today because we haven't talked about him very much yet. And, you know, Jean Charest has had a fascinating career. Uh, I think once upon a time, maybe the youngest or certainly one of the youngest cabinet ministers ever in Brian Mulroney's government. And then in 1993, one of just two Tories nationally left over after that uh, devastating election for that party. And, you, you know, you would think at that point his, he was, you know, finished politically. And yet he comes back to be the leader of the Quebec Liberals, becomes Premier. Uh, he seems to have nine lives. Everybody, of course, is writing him off for next time. But have people in this province, and particularly, I guess, the intellectuals and the media, have they learned that this is a guy you can't write off for good? Yeah, except that nine lives is just a total, right? You don't have a tenth one. <laughs> so, so he's at his ninth right at, now, is at, he? At some point, at some point, you could be on, in your ninth life. Uh, and, and the problem with the analysis like that uh, is it goes the, the reverse way. Since you survived so many times, you can't die. Well, everybody in politics knows that that's not true. And Giuseppe is a case in point uh, that, that nobody has a piedestal that is not made somehow of clay. Mr. Charest is in a bit of a bind. He is, the economy is souring. He needs uh, an opening to go in an election. His numbers with francophone voters who will decide the next government are dismal uh, for a premier seeking re-election. And he has a commission that will start hearings in the fall. And remember what happened to Paul Martin once Gomery got going. 
uh, you lose control of the backdrop for your election campaign. So there is a tight spot there. Uh, and, and it would be interesting to see if Mr. Charest can you know, pull another rabbit out of that uh, hat. But don't forget that there is something called fatigue and a normal cycle to politics. You've seen it at Queen's Park. You've seen it elsewhere. At some point, after three mandates in this place, uh, people think that it's time for a change, and that is also very hard. So he's got quite a tall order. I, I'm not saying it's not doable, but it, it is a tall order. Sometimes, Christian, when there is fatigue at one level of government, and I think now about uh, Jim Flaherty and Tony Clement and John Baird, uh, all of whom left the Ontario scene and became, if you like, superstars nationally. Uh, do you think Jean Charest has given up any national aspirations in politics? I don't know. It's, it's very hard. Uh, uh, maybe as a number two or three, I don't know if that's what Mr. Charest would like, but there's never been sort of a, 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 a provincial premier that has lost in the province that actually made it to the, be, be a leader, a successful leader on the federal stage. So uh, that's something we haven't seen in the past. One reason why we should not write off Mr. Charest now is, is um, uh, there is a window prior to the actual commission hearings where he could hold an election uh, and be on, on more solid ground. Plus the fact that, uh, not in this poll, but one just before that, 40% of Quebecers said that they strongly believe in the Plan Nord, in this new plan to develop the North. Um, I think one of the issues for Mr. Charest is this sort of legacy issue. Up until now, he had no sort of legacy he was leaving behind uh, outside the allegations of corruption. So is the Plan Nord this sort of... of, of uh, uh, of major sort of policy issue or shift that would actually bring him back to life. Um, it's hard to see, but it, it, it does seem that he's planted the right seed. Uh, will it work? Uh, that, that'll be up to Quebecers to, to uh, decide. But this will be sort of a dogfight three-way race where Mr. Charest could be the winner or the spoiler um, for, for God knows who. Uh, it'll be a fascinating year in Quebec politics, if you ask me. But Indeed we'll, it will. We'll what, have to see. What, what, yeah. what are the bets on the election right now? What, de what, what date? Well, the, the best would be uh, early fall or late spring. Uh, and, and, of course, uh, Mr. Charest is alone in deciding that. Okay, understood. Yeah, that's right. Just to, to be clear, no fixed election dates in Quebec. He goes when he wants, right? Totally. Exactly. Okay. Riel, let's try this. Uh, you know, again, from, from this side of the Quebec-Ontario frontier, we see the Bloc Québécois nationally wiped out. We see the Parti Québécois polling in third place right now. Uh, we see the Parti Québécois in second place among Francophones right now. And yet polls, I, sus I think, for sovereignty are still showing anywhere between 37 and 45 percent support, which is, if we're at the top of that number, that's a pretty good chunk. How is it possible that there is still so much support for sovereignty, but none of the official political vehicles for sovereignty? There's a huge gap there, and I think that gap is, can be partly explained because of the leadership that's been in place now for, under Pauline Marois and even the, her predecessors. Uh, the inability, as I said earlier, to clearly define a strategy to achieve sovereignty and, the, and a clear promise to do so and uh, come up with a program that will show uh, for, on the PQ side the benefits of achieving political independence. None of that has been done. So even though people uh, still believe in the option, or still have a con uh, still still have uh, belief that 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 eventually uh, sovereignty may may come one day, but uh, they have no confidence in the current leadership. And actually, one of the MNAs, Bernard de Rainville, PQ MNAs, said recently in an interview that if nothing is done to change this, uh, the PQ could disappear. And I think that's the greatest fear among some of the PQ uh, members and the caucus itself is that this party could go the way of the Bloc Québécois if no major changes are, are, are made soon. And by, by what, what, we, what we've seen over the last weekend's National Council meeting of the Parti Québécois, the meeting clearly showed that while they were able to adopt some measures that would give hope to the disaffected sovereignists who have left the party, there is no major change in the strategy, and Pauline Marois seems determined more than ever to pursue this whole idea of, of gaining more autonomy rather than promoting outright uh, independence or sovereignty. Hmm. The, only, the only leader who did it was, uh, was Jacques Parizeau back in the, in the late, late early 90s. He prepared the way for that referendum and came very close to winning it. But since then, there, there hasn't been that. So sovereignty supporters 
really are just looking around for, for perhaps a different option for the time being, waiting to see what will happen with the PQ and to see whether or not the PQ can come out of the next election campaign with a, with a decent number or, for, or go the way of the Bloc Québécois. Well, Chantal, let me follow up with this. Sometimes the simplest explanations are the best ones. Pauline Marois is not popular. Her party's in bad shape. Jack Layton was extremely popular. He won 59 seats. Period, full stop? Uh, no, that's, that's cutting it short. Uh, uh, to tell you the truth, I don't believe that uh, you can have a strategy uh, to do sovereignty unless there is a popular will for it. And if you look at every number, what it shows is uh, one in five who voted for sovereignty in 1995 now says he is not a sovereignist. Hmm. Uh, so that would speak to uh, a, a rather sharp decline for, for a cause. Uh, and uh, you can say that you're a sovereignist as you, and tell that to a pollster. And that doesn't mean that you want to be asked and to, or that you believe that you want to go down that road. So I, I don't believe that the past three leaders of the Parti Québécois uh, were bad leaders. But I, I do believe that uh, they could not lift uh, a rock without some push. And as for Mr. Pegasus, a great wisdom, I can't see how Jacques Pegasus' strategy would have done much of anything if the Meech Lake crisis had not happened. Hmm. So without the Meech Lake crisis, this, I mean, I saw David Peterson give a lecture the other day in which he said Meech Lake changed absolutely everything. The failure of Meech changed everything. You agree then? For me, uh, it gave the Parti Québécois and sovereignty a window and a, a new lease on life to try to bring this about, and it didn't work. And, and until they find a way, not a strategy, but some coalition to reconstruct on a different basis that kind of a movement, I can't see that sovereignty will happen or the PQ will be able to move that forward. And I don't believe that that coalition can be built without some outside event uh, suppose we draft people to go to war in Iran, for instance. Hmm. Uh, something that is so against the grain that it, it provokes that kind of a movement. But remember, anger uh, doesn't last. And I think that the, the angriness of many Quebecers at the time of the Meech Lake Accord has now dissipated, and those numbers speak to that. The almost 50% voted yes. On a good day, sovereignty gets 40%. Uh, well, so there's a missing 10% here. After all, that was 21 years ago. Anyway, thank you, everybody. I want to thank all four of you for participating in our discussion. Royal Seguin from the Globe and Mail in Quebec City, Christian Bourg, Leger Marketing in Montreal, Francois Charbonneau, University of Ottawa, Chantal Hébert, Toronto Star. Great to have all four of you with us. Merci beaucoup. My pleasure. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.